see here. So Epiphora is a very common complaint we all ophthalmologists face in our day-to-day -day OPD. So we all know the structure of lacrimal system and abnormality anywhere can cause Epiphora. Broadly, tearing is divided into over-secretion that is known as lacrimation or impaired drainage known as Epiphora. But in practice, we see a combination of these factors. Tearing. It can be either due to ocular inflammation or ocular surface disease which can cause reflex tearing or aberrant innervation of seventh nerve causing uh, which can uh, trigger watering while chewing as we see in crocodiles and another entity is hypersecretory syndrome which is very rare. Tearing due to impaired drainage, it can be due to obstruction or malposition of the structures or lacrimal pump failure. In such cases, we can see pooling of tears at the medial canthus. So some useful tips in the history taking. If it is unilateral, the cause is more towards obstruction. Bilateral, either reflex tearing or uh, malposition of the structures. Association to exposure to neoxia stimuli, again reflex, constant, more towards obstruction, intermittent, uh, to reflect more towards reflex tearing and also make a note of tears like whether it is clear purulent or blood stained as in you see in sac tumors associated pain and visual symptoms more towards reflex tearing past history ask for congenital stenosis history of uh, probing trauma surgeries medications including glaucoma medications topical chemotherapeutic agents systemic diseases, radiotherapy for periocular malignancies and all. Examination. Most of us will not miss all these common conditions, but there are some rare uh, things to note. So this patient came with a history of watering and there is a mild lid, lid retraction, upper lid retraction in, in his left eye. So when I asked to close his eye, he has a facial palsy, long standing Facial, uh, facial nerve palsy we might miss. Look for evidence of trauma like scars, nasal deviation, hypertelorism, etc. And swelling at the medial, uh, tenderness at the medial canthal area. If it is below the uh, insertion of the medial canthal tendon, uh, it is from the sac. In first case, it is a lacrimal abscess. And in second one, it is a sac tumor, uh, a firm and a fungating mass. And sometimes there will be canaliculus, um, fistulous communication between canaliculus and the skin. And ocular surface diseases like uh, pemphigus, Steven Johnson syndrome, dry eye, coloboma, exophthalmos, all can cause watering. So this patient came with a history of uh, watering after a history of infection with varicella six months back. So. Uh, syringing was patent in this girl, so while closing the eye, you can notice a sticture, a coloboma that was causing a epithelial defect and that was a cause of watering. And always evert the upper lid and see for the signs of allergic conjunctivitis, any foreign body and corneal staining also. So early morning watering with foreign body sensation while awakening from the sleep could be a recurrent corneal erosion. Floppy eyelid syndrome, here the upper eyelid is abnormally lax, thin and easily vertebral, causing co chronic papillo conjunctivitis and uh, this can cause eyelid imbrication syndrome, that is upper lid overrides the lower lid and uh, the lashes can touch the cornea. Malposition, uh, punctal eversion or frank ectropion or centurion syndrome. Here what happens is the nose will be prominent and the uh, anterior canthal, um, more me anterior insertion of the medial canthal tendon, anterior limb. So the punctum will not be in close opposition with the globe. Syringing will be patent in case in these cases and the patient can have watering. Failure of the lacrimal pump. Patients with poor orbicularis stone as in facial nerve palsy or in old age or uh, in patients with neurodegenerative diseases like uh, Parkinson's and all orbicularis stone you have to see that can cause lacrimal pump failure. So make a note of frequency of the blink and completeness of the blink. 
examination of puncta so many things for to see uh, punctal stenosis pouting punctum as in canaliculus or any carancular mass or even conjunctiva obstructing the punctal orifice canalicular obstruction uh, canaliculitis scarring stenosis of the canaliculus or any foreign bodies migratory punctal plugs and the pressure over the lacrimal sac uh, it can sometimes show regurgitation of pus known as raw plus sign tearing in a child uh, most commonly seen is ne- uh, congenital nasolacrimal duct obstruction other causes are membranous obstruction of the punctum atresia or total agenesis of the punctum or canaliculus conjunctivitis corneal conditions and eyelid abnormalities and always rule out congenital glaucoma investigations uh, rule out uh, glaucoma dry eye with uh, uh, appropriate investigations and test for lacrimal system is divided into anatomical and functional so if the syringing is not patent you can do probing and if it is a hard stop that means there is no canalicular obstruction you are directly touching the medial wall of the sac soft stop that means there is a canalicular obstruction fluorescent dye disappearance test is very useful in children who are not cooperative for probing and syringing that is instill fluorescent dye and examine the child after 5 minutes even after 5 minutes if you see the persistence of dye that means epiphora i mean watering is due to obstruction otherwise it is hypersecretion if the syringing is free still the patient has watering john's test is helpful here what we do is instill uh, fluorescent dye into the conjunctiva and uh, with a moist and cotton tip you see whether you can retrieve the staining if it is positive that means it is hyper watering is due to hypersecretion negative uh, two occasions it can cause one is partial obstruction of the nasolacrimal duct or canalicular block then do um, syringing so whatever dye if it is reached the sac it will come down and moisten uh, stain the bud if there is partial nld obstruction if the dye has not reached the sac uh, then the uh, syringe i mean there won't be staining so it uh, if it is not if it is negative that means it is either upper canalicular obstruction or lacrimal pump failure a nasal endoscopy is useful to rule out any nasal masses like polyps or scars or nasal deviation and all this patient came with a history of watering occasional watering with the blood stained discharge and there was a soft mass here so on nasal endoscopy we could see uh, rhinosporoidal mass in his inferior meatus dacryohistography and scintillography these are imaging techniques first one provides anatomical information so here we are uh, inserting a catheter and injecting the dye into the uh, uh, lacrimal system and uh, seeing uh, taking uh, radiographs if it is, fails to reach the inferior meatus that means there is an obstruction uh, scintillography is in more physiological conditions here radio labeled tears are uh, observed through a gamma camera and see whether it is coming to the inferior meatus ct scan for bony abnormalities craniofacial abnormalities fractures sinus or nasal diseases dacryo endoscopy is a newer advance here probing system is equipped with a fiber optic viewing system and you can directly view the site of obstruction and it is less traumatic to sum up with proper history and appropriate investigations you can come up with a diagnosis in most of the cases thank you uh and i keep wondering why should you know as oculoplastic surgeons which of us try to explain to the other how to do a dcr surgery because it's primarily our bread and butter and you can see you know papers that talk about 98% success rate this is 100% success rate then you know 97 in pediatric external dcr complex dcr has got 98 5.8 and so on and so forth so even when you compare external and endoscopic you got 90 plus so how much more are we looking to maximize our outcomes and uh, that's a little difficult to say because you know surgery that work, that uh, you know works well in each of our hands 
is something that we are set to you know comfortable doing and we tend rarely to change what we are already doing comfortably so i'm just going to share my tips on what i do to make sure that not only uh, is the patient but also the surgeon anxiety free during a dcr so i think optimizing systemic conditions like hypertensive status giving the patient an anxiolytic tablet like say a diazepam a day before uh, making sure that the bleeding parameters especially are in, in control and the patient is not on any uh, blood thinners all of that are important i used to be very casual about not starting decongestant sprays earlier uh, but uh, since recent i i mean since a few months i've started doing that and it mark it makes a market difference in the intraop uh, mucosal uh, vascularity nasal packing is should be good you know you, you, correct nasal packing and tamponade on the mucosa reduces intraoperative bleeding especially mucosal oozing and uh, another tip that i have you found is i use an entire vial of 1500 units of uh, hyaluronidase in 10 cc of block that allows the block to spread very well and patients are very comfortable throughout the surgery for the surgery video can i have that light turned off no okay so okay we won't have the light by the time that happens my actual dcr surgery will get over so we'll start for now yeah and now it has to be on the surgery not me so right so i'll quickly move on to the video so an incision is made a j shaped incision is pretty standard uh, i mean if there are any beginners out here a good block waiting for 10 minutes after a block now it's important not to cut with the cautery not to cut the orbicularis with the cautery what i use is the suction cannula itself to bluntly dissect the orbicularis off of the bone and using that it also you know suctions at the same time identify the medial canthal tendon there you can see it a lot of authors say do not cut it leave it intact but i feel unless you cut it with a cautery you won't be able to access the fundus of the lacrimal sac so you cut that and then reflect the periosteum with the sac from the lacrimal sac fossa now here you are using a periosteum elevator and separating the lacrimal sac fossa from the lacrimal sac and as you go more and more posterior you will see the uh, the bones and the junction of the bones there so that's the frontal process of the maxilla and the suture that it forms with the lacrimal bone i wish the lights were dimmer because it can be seen very well in this video but the brightness or lack of contrast is uh, not making it clear and using your uh, periosteum elevator itself you can actually create a small ostium once that is created using a small uh, bone punch in serially enlarging sizes you can put it in and punch it the trick is to push the mucosa inwards engage the bone and then as you press with your fingers and your thumb you need to give that jerk with your wrist so it's it's a twisting motion again you can see the mucosa push the mucosa engage the bone and as you crunch you also move your wrist to create a little bit of torsional force on the bone push engage and punch now gradually you keep punching and how much do you punch uh, so this is something that i learned from um, my mentor dr javed who i used to think used to be very excessive with his bone removal but now of course i agree with him and i make sure that i remove as much as bone as i show here superiorly about 5 mm above the common canaliculus anteriorly as much as possible preserving the bridge of the nose inferiorly till the bony nld is deroof and posteriorly till i see the ethmoidal air cells uh, in 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 the ostium so there's a big Uh, area of mucosa that is exposed a lot of people say as much as your finger or your little finger but i know my little finger is bigger than people's thumb so that's a very objective measurement i love this step using visco to fill up the lacrimal sac that distends the sac and then i use a 11 number blade to make two uh, vertical incisions 
and then using a, a Westcott scissor, you can then join those two incisions. What distending the lacrimal sac does is make sure that when you cut the lacrimal sac, the tip of your blade doesn't hit the medial wall of the lacrimal sac. So by doing that, I'm able to create a nice U-shaped flap. Uh, posterior flaps can either be left behind or excised. I like to excise them. Uh, now similarly, same U-shaped flaps are made on the nasal mucosa. Another step before doing this is to inject a little local anesthesia into the mucosa to blanch it. And that again reduces bleeding and reduces pain and discomfort for the patient. Here we are suturing only anterior flaps because that is what I prefer to do. You can see they are adequate. They try to overlap or they are a little edge to edge. The mucosal flap was a little extra large. So I use that. I use mitomycin C in all external DCRs and I'll come to Y. And using Vicryl, uh, 6 or Vicryl mucosa to mucosa approximation is done. Three such sutures are taken. The orbicularis is again uh, sutured together with one or two absorbable sutures and then the skin is closed. This video is on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, so if you wish to see it in higher definition, you can do that. Uh, another question is, when do we intubate? So, actually, if you look at the evidence, there is no clear class 1 evidence that tells you intubation is better than non-intubation. But anecdotal evidence tells you that cases of patients who've had previous dacryocystitis, uh, excessive bleeding, small sacs, small flaps, in these patients it may actually help in putting a tube. And finally, mitomycin C, when do you use it? Uh, you know, there are microscopic studies that have shown that anything, a cons yeah, this is my last but one slide, uh, the concentration of 0.2 milligram per ml and duration of three minutes. Anytime this is exceeded in either concentration or duration will lead to cell death and apoptosis. Whereas you don't need apoptosis, what we're looking is inhibition of fibroblasts. So to summarize, sound technique during primary surgery, good mucosal apposition and selective use of intubation with routine use of mitomycin C is what I do and that has served me well. Thank you. And I find that that to be good because the more endo DCRs they do, the more revision externals we'll have to do. Thank you. A very good afternoon. Uh, I thank the All India uh, Organizing Committee for giving me this opportunity. And I should also thank the previous speakers because they are making my work a little easier right now. So Akshay really beautifully spoke about DCR and how it's a very easy surgery. But I'm here to talk to you about failed DCR and how to get it right. So DCR as we know is creating an ostium between the lacrimal sac and the nasal pathway because there is a block. So there are various types at which DCR can be done and reporting success rates 85 to 90 almost 100%. Okay, but even in the most experienced hands, even with the best instrumentation, the latest techniques, failures do occur even in the best hands. And the failure rate, they say, is about 3 to 13 percent. So when you're dealing with failure, it's very important for us to know what type of failure you have. There are two types. We always think failure means a blocked ostium, which is not true. You can have something called a functional failure or an anatomical failure. And this functional failure is the one which is very common. Here you do syringing, it will be patent. The ostium, you do a nasal endoscope, it will be patent. But patient will keep coming and complaining that he has water. The anatomic is one that we most commonly deal with where the ostium or there is a block at some other level because of which the patient is complaining of water. So now that you know that there are two types of failure, first I'm going to talk about the ones which are anatomical. So anatomical will be cicatricial. As you can see in this picture, the entire ostium area is blocked. Or it can be a small ostium or it can be an ostium which is not properly placed. Uh, here you can see the ostium is too inferior, not even near the sac fossa area. Here the ostium is too low. Or you have sinecae in the nasal cavity. Otherwise you have the functional causes. This could be used usually to a, to a lid laxity, floppy eyelids. But play, pay attention, there could be other causes like an entropion, ectropion, conjunctural calasis, all of which are causing the watering. So it's important to counsel these patients. 
So there was a study done on 159 eyes of 135 patients, and they enumerated the causes of failed DCR, and they found that functional was the most highest, which was 58, and this was followed by 50 who had a narrow ostium, and 31 with the ostium was completely closed. At our institute also we studied 30 consecutive cases, and we found a small ostium to be the most common, where the sac was also not open completely. We had an intact. The entire thing was intact sac in six people, a fibrous ostium in five, and other small amounts of canalicular blocks. So then, once you know that okay, you have to look for a failure. How do you find out? Your simple clinical test. Most often, you can find out in your clinic. Simple test like your tear film height, dye disappearance test, dro class. Syringing and probing is an excellent method which helps you to find out the cause and a nasal endoscopic examination. So these are all the basic tests which already Dr. Ann has enumerated. So the probing helps you to know if it's anatomic, functional, soft stop, hard block, and whether it's a proximal or a distal block. Sometimes. your clinical tests don't help you we need to fall back on investigations and again like i shared already spoken about the ct dactyl cystogram is very useful it will show you the exact level of the block nowadays you have even an mr dactyl cystography can be done ct orbits can be done for patients who have fractures and you're trying to enumerate the causes so when do you image in such patients patients who are suspecting something like a sac pathology sac mass patients who have had uh, some kind of road traffic accident trauma so that will help you find out why the surgery failed in the first place also it's very important some people don't have nasal endoscopic examination they routine clinics so and they you have a patient presenting to you with a failed dcr you don't know what went wrong so please make sure to do a nasal endoscopic examination because sometimes you can have a gross deviated septum and that is the cause of failure so that needs to be corrected before you take up for a failed dcr surgery you can have an atrophic rhinitis granulomas polyps or some mass in the nasal mucosa also sometimes not not rare but does occur sarcoidosis vaginal granulomatosis of the sac which will mimic as an acute dactyl cystitis or you can actually have a lacrimal sac tumor so you need to keep all this in mind so now that you know these are the different causes how do you manage so first is prevention like how akshay has shown always do a nice meticulous surgery so what are the causes of failure he's already spoken about bleeding and why you need to use preoperative nasal decongestants so small atrophic sacs increase bleeding increase use of cautery yes cautery is important but not too much because it scars the whole area up. and fat prolapse if you open up the medial wall then your uh, medial wall of the sac you're going to have fat prolapse and that will block your ostium so very good evaluation good surgery primary surgery and treating the risk factors that's to prevent a failed dcr but once you've had a failed dcr what do you do this is a very beautiful study by uh, uh, timlin et al they have actually enumerated the different types of failures okay and they have done different surgical procedures for each type of failure and have given the success rates and failure rates for each of this and actually recommended which is the best so i'm going to enumerate these now so for a functional block first treat the causative factors in spite of that if the patient is very symptomatic then a conjunctival dactyl cystorhinostomy can be done last but not the least a simple technique in the clinics is lacrimal gland botulinum toxin injection which can be given which takes care of the watering This is a study by Kim et al. who has suggested that for patients with functional failure, you can actually intubate them. So they say that intubation has two roles. When you intubate, the punctum are well opposed, and two, the capillarity action actually helps to drain tears. They found that in patients who they remove the intubation post DCR, they actually complain of watering, and patients were happier when the intubation was placed back for them. So this is a, a, a interesting theory put forward. So you have an ostium which is small, not adequate size, which is what is causing symptoms. Then you can enlarge the ostium size. So balloon dactyloplasty has been well known for its use in cardiac angioplasties, and for even in uh, uh, small ostium, balloon dactyloplasty can be used to enlarge the ostium size. Or you can go ahead and stent them, or you can even go ahead and do an endoscopic revision surgery and enlarge the size of the ostium. Now, when you have a complete block, first it's important to localize where your block is. It could be at the level of proximal canaliculi, distal canaliculi, common canaliculus, or at the level of the ostium. So, treatment is going to vary based on this. So, if it's going to be a proximal canaliculi, your surgical, major surgical, like a revision DCR, is not going to work. So, here you need to do either a conjunctival dactyl cystorhinostomy or a canalicular dactyl cystor if you have the uh, facilities at your center. Otherwise, you have lacrimal gland botox. So, in conjunctival dactyl cystorhinostomy, it's important to counsel the patients because these patients, it's going to be a huge lifestyle change. They need to maintain the tube. The tubes can extrude out. They can migrate. So, all these are problems that they deal with, and hence you need to counsel before you take up patients for the surgery. Lacrimal gland Botox works really well. This is what I use for most of the patients with functional failure. 2.5 to 5 international units into the palpable robe works very well. It takes care of watering, but again, here counsel patient. It works only for four to six months, and you need to repeat injections after. 
So a distal and a common canaliculo block, if you have a block at this level, then you can do a trephination. You can trephine, you can break the membranes and then intubate these people. If the level of block is at the level of the common canaliculus, then you can even do a revision DCR, either external or endonasal DCR can be done along with silicon intubation. It's a must for cases with canalicular blocks. Now you have a block at the level of the ostium. So what do you do? It has to be either a revision, either external or an endonasal DCR. A plus or minus adjuncts you can use. And they say that the uh, success rate for revision surgery is as high as 80 to 90 for the external route and as high as 100% even for the endonasal route. So this is a small video. So for lack of time, I think I'll just skip the video. Just small things that I want to point out is when you're doing a revision, when you have the sac and you have the bone, it's very important to identify the previous ostium. Dissect carefully, make sure you remove all the scar tissue and entire bone such that the ostium is completely free. Same with even an endoscopic revision, make sure that you open up the sac area completely and with your pass your probes and make sure that there's no bone. Yeah, mitomycin and thing they've already spoken about and so that's right. So please make sure that all failed DCRs don't go ahead and immediately do a revision surgery, evaluate the patients and counsel your patients well. Thank you. So we start with 2.5. You can repeat it as many times, but usually it's four to six months between injections. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a long talk and I will try to restrict myself to the practical aspects. So, uh, all right. So, uh, when we talk of ptosis, uh, we all should know that there is a condition called as pseudotosis and pseudotosis is classically there when there is hypotrophia, you occlude the other eye, this ptosis disappears. Then there may be other causes like blepharospasm or brotosis which are not true ptosis. There may be contralateral enlarged palpable fissure like retraction or proptosis or there may be ipsilateral small eyes or small appearing eyes like anophthalmos, microphthalmos, thysis and enophthalmos. So these are the causes of pseudotosis. When we talk about the true ptosis, we all know that most cases are congenital, around 60% are congenital and 40% are acquired. In acquired, we have got most of causes. When we talk of congenital ptosis, 90% of them are simple and 10% are complicated. They are complicated when they are associated with other anomalies like double elevator palsies, synkinetic ptosis or blepharophimosis syndrome. So whenever we do a case of, we evaluate a case of ptosis, we ask for pertinent history. One very important thing nowadays is use of steroid eye drop post cataract surgery ptosis is quite common and generally, generally it disappears with time. In ptosis, we make a detailed ptosis chart. I'll not go into these details, but you must evaluate these four points. Howsoever busy practitioners are you, you have to check these four points. What are these four? Amount of ptosis measurement, levator function measurement, Bell's phenomena checking, and whether your ptosis is simple or complicated. So these four points are mandatory to check in any given case. Then there is a mnemonic bad sign for ptosis surgery. Bells stand in bells. B stand for poor bells. A for corneal anesthesia and D for dry eye. So if any of these three is present, then these these patients they do uh, bad or uh, they do, do not do well after surgery. Ptosis amount measurement. There are two ways: MRD method and the palpable fissure method. In unilateral cases, you take difference with healthy eye. In bilateral cases, obviously, you take difference with the standard measurements. So this is about MRD method. I will not go into this detail. I think all of you know about it. Palpable fissure height, you directly measure or you just combine MRD1 and MRD2. So we grade ptosis CVAT based on these findings. MRD1, uh, if ptosis is 2 millimeter, then it is mild. If it is 3, moderate, and if it is 4 or more, it is severe. It is always pertinent to check for levator function. How to check it? You have to tell patient to look down. Then you stabilize the bro by pressing your thumb directly over the bone. 
and then ask patient to look up and check for the excursion of upper eyelid. So this is the correct way of checking levator function. But sometimes we do it in a improper way. What we are doing here is we are pulling the brow up while checking the measurement. This will give you erroneous high reading. And likewise, you can push the brow down while checking levator function. So this will give you erroneous low readings. So you'll have to check it correctly. Then the other way of uh, extrapolating levator function is MRD3 or MLD test. This is margin limbal distance test in which distance between center of upper eyelid margin and lower lid limbus is taken at 6 o'clock. Now we go on to the third point which is Bell's phenomena point. First was stosis measurement, second was levator function and third was Bell's. So, we label bells as good when more than two-thirds of cornea disappears while attempting closure of uh, eyelid, fair if one-third to two-third disappears and poor if less than one-third disappears. Then there may be other variety of bells like normal, inverse, reverse or perverse. So a poor bells phenomena invariably warrants either no surgery or under correction with silicone rod. You do not want a significant lag of thalmos in these cases otherwise it you will have exposed cornea post-operatively. So now there are causes of complicated ptosis as I told you, either synkinetic ptosis or with elevator palsy or blepharophimosis syndrome. So synkinetic ptosis we all know, there is opening of eyelid on clinching of mouth or opening of mouth or sideway movement of mouth. And also these cases also are sometimes associated with the elevator palsy. Patient is looking up, this eye is not moving up. So same patient is having two things, elevator palsy with Marcus gun. Blepharophimosis syndrome, a distinct entity. There is a tetrad of ptosis, blepharophimosis, telecanthus and epicanthus inversus along with other minor features. I will not go into these details. Acquired ptosis causes neurogenic, myogenic, ap aponeurotic, mechanical, traumatic. Neurogenic causes, these are the important causes, third now and Horner syndrome. For Horner syndrome, you need to always do a phenylephrine test. If it is positive phenylephrine test, then you can do MMCR surgery. If it is negative, then obviously this surgery will not be successful. Other causes of myogenic, myasthenia gravis, dystrophies like CPEO. You must remember these causes, contact lens wearer and use of steroid eye drop and mascara. So this is very important to check history of mascara use also. All right. So myasthenia, you need to do a respect test and there is an elevation. Okay, madam, one minute. I am supposed to speak for 10 minutes. No, okay. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is CPO. So I will not go into these details, mechanical and traumatical ptosis. So one slide regarding decision making of toxic surgery. Congenital ptosis, ideal age for surgery is 4 to 5 years. You do early surgery if there are chances of amblyopia. You will have to always refract patient under cycloplegia because there are n number of patients who are having an isometer of amblyopia along with ptosis and this is your duty to treat that also. Your surgical aim in congenital ptosis is mild under correction if there is good levator action and over, little over correction if there is poor levator action. In acquired ptosis, basic principle is to wait for six months of stable ptosis period before doing any surgery and you aim for mild under correction. There are various options. For mild ptosis, you do phenylephrine test. If it is positive, do MMCR. If it is negative, go for a fasanella servet or levator. In moderate ptosis, you have to always do a levator surgery like resection or plication. They are the procedure of choice. For severe bilateral ptosis, frontalis sling is the procedure of choice. For severe unilateral ptosis, nowadays we are also doing frontalis flap. You can do frontalis sling, vitnal sling or levator resection. So this is about the basic principles. I will not go into these details. So these are some of the photographs of various surgeries. This is MMCR. I will not go into surgical details. So we all know about levator resection, frontalis sling and all silicone sling there are certain advantages and disadvantages we all know how to do it so uh, in a young patient where there is amblyopia uh, chances of amblyopia you operate early so this is 
one of such patient where early surgery was done so in sling i intend to do skin muscle excision because if we do not do it there will be bogey lids nowadays we aim not only for proper ptosis correction but we aim for other ancillary th- things like there should be a proper lid fold not overhanging skin there should be proper symmetry in down gauge so we do various things to achieve these so one of these things is we do skin muscle excision along with sling so this is where skin muscle excision has been done along with sling this is facial lata which is which we take from a pretty small incision but i'll not go into these details so this is marcus gun phenomena where bilateral excision with sling facial lata sling has been done you can see marcus gun has been obliterated and similarly for acquired ptosis so to conclude key to proper management in ptosis is thorough evaluation you have to adopt a tailored approach for every case according to the suitability of patient and of course one must always explain realistic results and side effect to the patients thank you thank you for your patience here on topic and i'll try to restrict myself to the practical aspects so uh, all right so uh, when we talk of ptosis uh, we all should know that there is a condition called as pseudotosis and pseudotosis is classically there when there is hypertrophia you occlude the other eye this ptosis disappears then there may be other causes like blepharospasm or protosis which are not true ptosis there may be contralateral and large palpable fissure like retraction or proptosis or there may be ipsilateral small eyes or small appearing eyes like anophthalmos microphthalmos thysis and enophthalmos so these are the causes of pseudotosis when we talk about the true ptosis we all know that most cases are congenital around 60% are congenital and 40% are acquired in acquired we have got most of causes when we talk of congenital ptosis 90% of them are simple and 10% are complicated they are complicated when they are associated with other anomalies like double elevator palsy synkinetic ptosis or blepharophimosis syndrome so whenever we do a case of we evaluate a case of ptosis we ask for pertinent and history one very important thing nowadays is use of steroid eye drop post cataract surgery ptosis is quite common and generally generally it disappears with time in ptosis we make a detailed ptosis chart i'll not go into these details but you must evaluate these four points howsoever busy practitioners are you you have to check these four points what are these four amount of ptosis measurement levator function measurement bell's phenomena checking and whether your ptosis is simple or complicated so these four points are mandatory to check in any given case then there is a mnemonic bad sign for ptosis surgery bell stand in bells b stand for poor bells a for corneal anesthesia and d for dry eye so if any of these three is present then these pers- these patients they do uh, bad or uh, they do, do not do well after surgery ptosis amount measurement there are two ways mrd method and the palpable fisher method in unilateral cases you take difference with healthy eye in bilateral cases obviously you take difference with standard measurements so this is about mrt method i will not go into this detail i think all of you know about it palpable fissure height you directly measure or you just combine mrt1 and mrt2 so we grade ptosis cvrt based on these finding mrt1 uh, if ptosis is 2 mm then it is mild if it is 3 moderate and if it is 4 or more it is severe it is always pertinent to check for levator function how to check it you have to tell patient to look down then you stabilize the bro by pressing your thumb directly over the bone and then ask patient to look up and check for the excursion of upper eyelid so this is the correct way of checking levator function but sometime we do it in a improper way what we are doing here is we are pulling the bro up while checking the measurement this will give you erroneous high reading and simul- likewise you can push the bro down while checking levator function so this will give you erroneous low readings so you'll have to check it correctly then the other way of uh, extrapolating levator function is mrd3 or mld test this is margin limbal distance test 
in which distance between center of upper eyelid margin and lower lid limbus is taken at 6 o'clock. Now we go on to the third point which is Bell's phenomena point. First was stosis measurement, second was levator function and third was Bell's. So we label Bell's as good when more than two third of cornea disappears while attempting closure of uh, eyelid. Fair if one third to two third disappears and poor if less than one third disappears. Then there may be other variety of Bell's like normal, inverse, reverse or perverse. So a poor Bell's phenomena invariably warrants either no surgery or under correction with silicon rod. You do not want a significant lag of thalamus in these cases otherwise you will have exposed cornea postoperatively. So now there are causes of complicated ptosis as I told you either synkinetic ptosis or with elevator palsy or blepharophimosis syndrome. So synkinetic ptosis we all know. There is opening of eyelid on clinching of uh, mouth or opening of mouth or sideway movement of mouth. And also these cases also are sometimes associated with the elevator palsy. Patient is looking up, this eye is not moving up. So same patient is having two things, elevator palsy with Marcus gun. Blepharophimosis syndrome, a distinct entity. There is a tetrad of ptosis, blepharophimosis, telecanthus and epicanthus inversus along with other minor features. I will not go into these details. Acquired ptosis causes neurogenic, myogenic, ap aponeurotic, mechanical, traumatic. Neurogenic causes, these are the important causes, third now and Horner syndrome. For Horner syndrome, you need to always do a phenylephrine test. If it is positive phenylephrine test, then you can do MMCR surgery. If it is negative, then obviously this surgery will not be successful. Other causes of myogenic, Myasthenia gravis, dystrophies like CPEO, you must remember these causes, contact lens wearer and use of steroid eye drop and mascara. So this is very important to check history of mascara use also. Alright, so myasthenia, you need to do eye spec test and there is an elevation. Okay, madam, one minute, I am supposed to speak for 10 minutes. Alright, so anyway. So uh, this is CPO, so I will not go into these details, mechanical and traumatical ptosis. So one slide regarding decision making of toxic surgery, congenital ptosis, ideal age for surgery is 4 to 5 years. You do early surgery if there are chances of amblyopia, you will have to always refract patient under cycloplegia because there are n number of patients who are having anisometrophic amblyopia along with ptosis and this is your duty to treat that also. Your surgical aim in congenital ptosis is mild undercorrection if there is good levator action and over, little over correction if there is poor levator action. In acquired ptosis, basic principle is to wait for six months of stable ptosis period before doing any surgery and you aim for mild under correction. There are various options. For mild ptosis, you do phenylephrine test. If it is positive, do MMCR. If it is negative, go for a fasanella servet or levator. In moderate ptosis, you have to always do a levator surgery like resection or plication. They are the procedure of choice. For severe bilateral ptosis, frontalis sling is the procedure of choice. For severe unilateral ptosis, nowadays we are also doing frontalis flap. You can do frontalis sling, vitnal sling or levator resection. So this is about the basic principles. I will not go into these details. So these are some of the photographs of various surgeries. This is MMCR. I will not go into surgical details. So we all know about levator resection, frontalis sling and all silicone sling there are certain advantages and disadvantages we all know how to do it so uh, in a young patient where there is amblyopia uh, chances of amblyopia you operate early so this is one of such patient where early surgery was done so in sling I intend to do skin muscle excision because if we do not do it there will be bogey lids Nowadays, we aim not only for proper ptosis correction, but we aim for other ancillary th things like there should be a proper lid fold, not overhanging skin, there should be proper symmetry in down gauge. So we do various things to achieve these. So one of these things is we do skin muscle excision along with sling. So this is where skin muscle excision has been done along with sling. 
This is fascia lata, which is which we take from a pretty small incision, but I'll not go into these details. So this is Marcus Gunn phenomena, where bilateral excision with sling, fascia lata sling has been done. You can see Marcus Gunn has been obliterated. And similarly for aquatosis. So to conclude, key to proper management in tosis is thorough evaluation. You have to adopt a tailored approach for every case according to the suitability of patient. And of course, one must always explain realistic results and side effects to the patients. Thank you. Thank you for your patience here. Um, so apart from ptosis, I'll try to touch upon these. And let's not go into the anatomy part of all this, why the lag of thalamus occurs and all that. And we know the medical management is either by drops, taping or sometimes chemical um, by chemo, um, chemical tarsorophy. And uh, you can see in this lady who had had a Bell's facial palsy, uh, she has had her both medial and lateral canthoplasty. And sometimes it would be a little insufficient. So, so you may have to couple them with retraction repair, spacers, weights and other ancillary procedures, which I will just touch upon in the next couple of slides. And this patient also, like I said, has had his medial canthoplasty and lateral tarsal strip. And obviously this is insufficient. So we do a retraction repair. Now, uh, this is the posterior approach of the retraction repair. What I do is, uh, uh, raise the conjunctival flap and below that is the Muller's muscle and this Muller's muscle is separated from the um, uh, levator posteriorly and conjunctiva anteriorly and it is excised. So this would be his and it's closed using glue. And this is his post-operative appearance. Once the retraction repair is done, he's able to close well and the lag of thalamus is much reduced. So lid weights, I'm not a great fan of weights, so I'm not going to touch upon these. And sometimes when there is in facial palsy patients, when they have, uh, they're usually associated with brow ptosis. So what we do is you can do any type of brow lift that I would do here a direct brow lift. And that's how we anchor how much we need to excise. You lift up the brow and drop it down and that would be your limit and medially I usually uh, make this kind of an incision so that lifts up the medial portion much more than the lateral portion and that's excised and this is her pre-op and this is her post-op so once we lift that it's also coupled with the lateral tarsal strip or any other ancillary procedures that you need so this patient had had his a brow lift done elsewhere with the medial tarsorophy you can see and the lateral tarsal strip was also done but that was obviously insufficient so what we did was we did a blephrotomy we did a medial thermoplasty a lateral tarsal strip spacer and also a soof lift so to give him this kind of an appearance and in this patient you can see that the mild retraction of the lower lid is there so what we did was we injected a little bit of fillers here and gave that lift in traumatic uh, lag of thalamus, you can see that this child has had a trauma which is um, extending in the large extent and you can see his eyebrows is almost at the mid forehead level, multiple z-plasties would got the, uh, bra brought down his brow to a much lower level and the lag of thalamus is reduced. So basically, it's just not one procedure that it is required, you might have to tailor, tailor make it and you have to use a couple of them. So next, coming on to retraction, this patient came with unilateral ptosis and contralateral retraction. So it's uh, it's most often times it is good to uh, repair the uh, retraction rather than the ptosis because they accept that better. So this was the same retraction repair that I did with the posterior approach and you can see the kind of correction that he has got. This is similar patient. This is the first post-operative day. You have to aim at under over correcting them. After a month or so, it goes back to its position and it would be corrected on the table. So this was a patient with thyroid eye disease. You always know that they do have uh, lag of thalamus and this patient underwent a three wall orbital decompression and so does this lady, a three wall orbital decompression with a blephrotomy. 
and ectropion let's not go into the theory of ectropion the medical management we all know the surgical management this is some of the common procedures that we do so basically it is the horizontal shortening and the lengthening which is a common requirement for both ectropion and entropion patients i think in the interest of time i'll skip lateral tarsal strip because most of us do lateral tarsal strip and uh, it is something similar to what everybody does so no lateral tarsal strip tarsal ectropion is um, i find this procedure a little more easier for me you can either do it or uh, anchoring the retractors from the conjunctival side but i do this uh, raghavan sampath's uh, lester technique where i take the um, i use the 50 uh, pro vicral and uh, come from the skin about 4 mm uh, 2 mm or 3 mm below the lash go into the conjunctiva and out through the fornix so that grabs the retractor and with the other end sorry so come out through the fornix and tie it so three or four such um, sutures would uh, correct the retractor stuck so this would be the kind of appearance that he gets and this works well for me and i couple it with lateral tarsal strip now something that new that i have started doing and i'm sure many of you would be doing is the bix procedure the modified bix procedure that i use and i find this a much more easier than doing the lateral tarsal strip and another technique is the sutra canthopexy where you just open up the um, lateral orbital rim and a 50 proline is uh, vicral is taken and a knot is um, placed to prevent slippage and a small stab incision is made at the lateral most angle of the um, eyelid and a suture is passed from there to the wound that you have created the opening that you have created you anchor it to the periosteum and the, with the other end you go through the same stab incision that you have created come out to the periosteum and knot it so that gives a little tighter skin now this was something that i used to do i used to do previously is the open technique where i used to open it up and then uh, make a small ins- uh, opening here and hitch the lateral uh, medial part of the tarsus to the posterior aspect uh, i mean the uh, lacrimal crest but i stopped do- uh, doing that now although that gives good correction because i find this a little easier the thermoplasty where what we do is we uh, burn the uh, area below the horizontal part of the canaliculus do a carunculectomy and the medial end of the tarsus is hitched in a posterior superior direction towards the upper eyelid so the raw surfaces they attach to each other and the the uh, traction is much better it gives a pull so the uh, the punctum actually opposes very well to the globe rather than the uh, the routine technique of plication of the um, medial canthal tendon so just go retro carunculer where you have created the raw surface come on to the stab incision that you have created and stitch it secure it over a bolster so mechanical ectropion we all know you just have to remove the um the causative factor cicatricial ectropion is all with uh, z plasty you can uh, bring the upper uh, lid flap onto the lower eyelid or sometimes 5 fu injection gives a good results and if it is a bad scar like this you can couple it with um um grafts and give them a reasonably good results 
and uh, so also this patient who has had uh, you can see this notch which is um, that can be counteracted actually if you just put a mini monaca stent it might you know later on can give a scar uh, you know a notch like that so i usually couple them with the thermoplasty suture but without the thermoplasty of course that gives a counter traction so this patient had had uh, um, neurofibromatosis repair done elsewhere and i just did a shortening of the posterior lamella and could correct the lag of thalamus entropion i think we all know and interest of time can i skip that or is there time no time so okay we'll skip all that jones procedure most of us know what to do so let's not go into the details of that botox and this is something that i just want to briefly touch upon if there is time um this is a patient with a spastic entropion and what we did was just remove the uh, the um uh, the preceptal portion of the orbicularis and you can see this uh, this gentleman was not able to open his eyes to bright light and this is how he is terminal tarsal rotation works well for the posterior uh, uh, for the cicatricial uh, entropion tarsal wedge resection is good congenital just briefly to touch and epiblepharon also modified hots procedure epicanthus i think mukesh has uh, already touched upon let's not go into that Ep uh, uriblepharon and uh, centurion syndrome is something that we can look out uh, look at it and uh, there's a lot more to the story but in the interest of time i'll skip all that thank you very much the past i'll just share three videos it will essentially uh, uh, to a comprehensive ophthalmologist point out the basic techniques can the size be a little shorter it become a little too large missing out on parts and we need to look at the basic principles and look at the techniques either for non marginal defects or full thickness defects and particularly on how to construct our canthi lateral and medial in order to get the right position of the eyelid so various types of unilateral or bilateral upper lid colobomas may be present but the most common reason why we do a, a repair is for surgical resection of eyelid tumors followed by trauma So we need always to consider the eyelid as being constituted by anterior lamina, constituted by skin and orbicularis, and the posterior lamina constituted by tarsal conjunctiva, along with levator and mullus muscle. And we need to reconstruct both, preferably at least one with a retained vascular supply, either as a flap or um, some other way in which we can retain the vascular supply, like for example a vascular pedicle. Now. um the non marginal defects are usually converted into a simple elliptical shape preferably along lines of tension so as to avoid creating any um uh, pull by the fibers of the muscle langans line that we lang we used to know about some of these defects like this can be taken care of by a partial thickness skin graft but most often we require to do full thickness repairs for defects like this up to 1/4 defects can be direct closed like in this patient so let's look at the video for repair so this is a technique which uses double um vertical mattress sutures three vertical mattress sutures work under magnification and good illumination preferably microscope or a loop first suture as you see is a vertical mattress suture which went 3 mm from cut edge and came back to the same side 1 mm from the cut edge 1 mm depth and when tied it gives a little pout the first suture was just posterior to the gray line which is giving a firm bite through the tarsus second suture as you can see is closer to posterior margin and again as a vertical mattress suture we are using a 60 silk and once these are tied they are giving a good pout the third suture is close to lash line and is then again coming back in the same way and you can see that the posterior two sutures have been left long so that they can all be tied in the anterior most suture silk is softer so less chances of causing irritation to the globe and the posterior sutures are tied in the anterior most sutures so that you do not have any suture ends going posteriorly now partial thickness bite through the tarsus with 60 vicryl so that you close the tarsus well and then 
after you've taken care of dog ear, suture the skin with 60 nylon or silk, whatever you prefer. So this gives a good marginal repair and, and the face tissue being very vascular, you get very good uh, results. So this is an example of a basal cell carcinoma excised as a pentagon. When the defect is a little larger, you need to use either skin flaps or a tensile flap where we rotate a flap from the lateral side of the canthus or you can share the material from the other lid either just the conjunctiva or both the layers now we will go if you can see the video i'll go ahead with the video so this is the tensile's technique which can be used frequently and a comprehensive ophthalmologist can do it we are making the edges raw and then we will mobilize a flap on the lateral side. The defect must be made pentagonal with margins perpendicular to the margin going up to the upper border of tarsus and then creating the pentagon. So you can see the flap that is being raised for the upper lid. It goes with the curvature down and goes up to the lateral orbital rim. Canthotomy is done and cantholysis which means the canthal tendon is also cut and so that the whole flap is freed totally and is a running continuity with the eyelid margin so that it can become a part of the lateral eyelid margin see the lateral canthal tendon being cut so that is cantholysis and then a marginal repair is carried out as we discussed earlier and that lateral part of the skin becomes a part of our margin And then the lateral canthus is reconstituted, closed, and then the skin is closed. So that completes the closure. So tensile's repair can give you very rewarding results as in this case of trauma. And it can give a correction which is quite good. You can use flaps from forehead or from the upper lid which can be used for reconstruction. I'll just go to the third video. Now about the lid sharing techniques are good because they take tissue which is very similar to what is needed from the other lid. And it is to be avoided in young children where tissue laxity is less and where you want to avoid closure of the pupil. So let's just look at the use of tarso conjunctival flap technique and then I'll just summarize. So this is a defect here in the upper lid after excision of a large mybumian carcinoma. So let's look at the technique here, how we use the inner layer. The excising the tumor with a clear margin of about five millimeters as you would do in a, a sebaceous carcinoma. And then the important thing will be that you must send it for histopathology, but before that a frozen section especially in sebaceous carcinoma. So after sebaceous carcinoma, we get a report saying that there is an involvement on one aspect. So we do some more excision till we get a free report. And then a tarso connectable flap is made just like any other flap in sharing the lids with a four millimeter margin to retain the vascular supply in the fragment that is left behind. And then this flap is mobilized and used to create the posterior lamina. and you can see how it is sutured both ends are sutured first then the center is sutured and then you can close the lamina. so this way you can get a good correction cutler beard procedure you utilize after the excision the flaps both skin muscle and tarso conjunctiva from the opposite side so if, if it is even larger defects then you use inner lamina reconstruction by tarso conjunctiva or nasal mucocartilage and then flaps either from the temporal side or from the midline as you see here. But lastly, we'll talk about the repair of the canthi. What is important is to anchor the tarsal plate to the lateral periosteum well, like we are doing here. Useful to use a permanent suture and take a double arm bite which goes from the periorbita which means behind the bite is starting behind the rim and then coming interiorly and a little higher to give you good anchorage so good anchorage for lateral canthus is important and medial canthus it is important to fix posterior to the sac at the posterior lacrimal crest to give the right direction that is the key to 
repair of posterior uh, medial canthus. So these are essentially, and then some cases you need low profile mini plates to, in order to get a good fixation. To conclude, eyelid repair is customized based on the properties of the defect that you have. Partial thickness defects repaired by simple closure. Full thickness defects you need to reconstitute skin muscle and a mucosal lining with a supporting structure, particularly when larger. For so smaller ones, just mucosal lining will do. And precise reconstruction and of lateral and medial canthus is integral. So a combination of techniques is important with sound knowledge and adherence to basic principles. Thank you.